your role is absolutely critical. The bishop of my diocese, Cardinal Donardo, I think he's the one who said this. He said that Catholic education is the number one place for evangelization. Because oftentimes, especially in catechism, I, as a catechist, I've had situations where the parents bring their kids to catechism class, but they don't take them to Mass. So that's your one shot. And if the parents aren't on your side, that's even a harder, longer shot that you have. And so I, I, I want to do a couple of things. I want to help you as a catechist, yes. I want to help you grow in your own personal holiness, yes. But I also want to, to say don't be discouraged. Because a lot of times the devil... Okay, so if this is the number one place for evangelization, it's also the number one place where the devil is going to be battling. This is... Evangelization is spiritual warfare. And it's a battle for souls. And... The devil, some of the whispers that the devil can tell us, one, as catechists, that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not holy enough, I can't do that, I'm not the one for that, which is all a lie, you are the one for that. If you don't do that, who will do that? But I, I don't know that much. That's okay. Do you think the apostles knew that much? No, they didn't. But the Holy Spirit help them. And you have been confirmed. All of you, I hope, have received the sacrament of confirmation. That is the same sacrament that, that the apostles received at Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If you check the catechism, that is the same spirit, the same power that is given to you. So that lie that you're not smart enough or you're not holy enough or you're not good enough, that is exactly a lie. It's also a lie that your kids aren't converting because it's not necessary that they convert after the class. Because Jesus himself, who had all the charisms, all the gifts, all the powers of the Holy Spirit, he preached, and guess what? People left. They saw miracles, and they still left. You're, as far as I know, you're not working any miracles. I haven't worked any miracles yet. But what happened after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came down, those same people, later on, by hearing St. Peter preach, they were converted. And so it might be that we plant the seeds and at the right time when the Holy Spirit finds it necessary, those people we've planted the seeds with will convert. Now, when I was planning these, these talks, I went to uh, Our Lady of Fatima Centennial Image, not the one that the sisters had brought around, but a different one. I'd been to that one as well. And I was praying and I was like, what should these, ti what, what should these talks be titled? The, the title for this talk would be, I was... I was like, okay, let's be conservative, Blessed Mother. And she was like, no, saving God's children. That's what this talk would be called, saving God's children. I wanted protecting God's children because, hey, I can't do no saving. I, I can protect them. But no, she says that it's our role. When, when this, we're the only Jesus that these people are going to experience. We're the only Blessed Mother that these, some of these young people will ever experience. It's going to be our job to fight back. And, and we have to view that when we're in the classroom we have to be willing to fight back because everywhere the children go, they are receiving a counter message, an anti-Christ message. They turn on the radio, it's not gospel values. They go to the movies, it's not gospel values. Even movies that are aimed at children, they sneak in sick and perverse stuff. If they don't hear a counter message, the message that they're getting from the world is, your faith does not matter. Put that on the back burner for when you're sick or when you're dying, but it does not impact my daily life. So the first, so this talk has three aspects. I'm going to give you three different generalization tips. The first one is defend the faith. In absolutely every single thing you do from early ages, from even if you're teaching kindergarten, first grade through eighth grade, in every lesson that you present, defend the faith. What are the attacks that these people might give to my children? They don't see it as attacks. They see it as enlightening them. So even from a young age, every class that you present, let's say you're talking about confession. Well, it's not, when we're teaching about confession, it's not just about accepting God's mercy. But I have to say, where is this in the Bible? And you have to tell them. People are going to tell you that confession is not in the Bible. People are going to tell you, why do you confess your sins to a man when you can confess them directly to God? So I would ask of you, before every lesson you present, ask yourself, how could this lesson be attacked? How is this lesson relevant to them? How is the devil going to use this in their own life? So, for example, for confession, I would say, remember John chapter 20, verse 21, 22, and 23. Now, I'm not saying to go outside of your ordinary lesson plans. We need to integrate basic apologetics, basic defenses 
of the faith into every single lesson. And even saying, so this is about confession, this is about accepting God's mercy, but it's important because you will meet people who are going to say that this is wrong. And they might say, well, that's not in the Bible. And it is, and I want you to know where it is. And even if you can't remember this, and I don't expect you to, you should know that it is in the Bible. And then you explain where. It's loving, it's, you know, it's charitable, but at the same time, I'm not going to dodge the, the conflicts that they are going to experience when they get older. Also, what are some other temptations? The devil might say, don't go to confession. Confess your sins later. And then, what about confessing directly to God? And then you can say, I'll show you right here, Jesus tells the apostles, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. And then they'll see this and they'll say, yeah, that's true. One of the, the ways the Catholics lose people, it's not just from atheistic lifestyle, it's because mass is boring and outwardly looking, I can see why they would say that. And then we're going to lose people to the local Baptist church, the local non-denominational, the church where they can go and have fun and listen to music. So you know in your head that that's going to be one of the things that are going to be tugging at them and pulling at them. Even from a young age, they need to know why that isn't the real church. That Jesus Christ founded this church. Jesus Christ gives us himself in the Eucharist. Jesus gives us confession. Jesus gives us a priest. Jesus gives us the saints. And all they have is the Bible. So of course they're going to be Bible, 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 Bible. That's all they got. And God does speak to people through the Bible. And so we need to have that in ours as well. But we need to warn them that, yeah, Sunnybrook or whatever the name of the local, you know, mega church is, that might be fun, but it's not really what Jesus Christ instituted and wanted for you. And so that they'll know this from a young age. So even when they see their aunts or their uncles or their parents going to this mega church, they'll know deep down you've planted that seed that this isn't the way Jesus instituted the church. This isn't what Jesus had in mind. So with every lesson we have to have apologetics that defend against our non-catholic brothers and sisters and defend against the atheistic mindset of the world and defend against the, the, the little temptations that you yourself have experienced so that's number one in every lesson possible try and find some way of apologetics you can do a google search you can do what has been relevant in your own life but you have to have concrete details going off our feelings is not going to work it doesn't work it doesn't work for me when I'm having temptations to fear and doubt and anxiety. I need something concrete that I can rely upon. So that's number one, defending the faith. Number two is sowing seeds in the faith. So first I have to defend it, and then I have to sow my own seeds. And how do you do this? Well, I look at the Blessed Mother as the number one evangelist. So if you look throughout the history of the church, the times that the Blessed Mother has appeared, she's always bringing mass conversions. But at the same time, she's always giving us something tangible. She's giving us scapulars. She's giving us rosaries and the image of Our Lady Guadalupe. Look, you, you can go to Mexico and even in the most pagan sources, places, they still have Our Lady of, of Our Lady of Guadalupe there. So she knows how to bring souls to her. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to give out sacramentals holy reminders so that once we're long gone, the effects, the Lord still has the opportunity to speak to them. That's why on, I gave you these images. And on the back, like from my talk later with the teens, on the back of my holy reminder is my lesson plan. And so my goal is that even if they don't listen to my message, and I, they have this picture and I can convince them to put the picture up in their house and it's in their room and they might not, and it's there and they don't even think about it. They don't think about it at all. And maybe they just did something really bad and they're despairing or maybe they're even thinking about suicide because something's happening in their life or just things are not going well. They see this image and at least God has the opportunity to speak to them through this image. So. I have to know that, yes, I'll do the best I can. I'll teach them the best I can. But the courage and the grace for conversion for them, it's going to have to be from God himself. And so we need to give as many opportunities for, by giving out sacramentals. That's one. And that's going to cost something. Like all these materials, these cost somebody something. But one aspect that's kind of, goes, that's kind of the, the pervasive theme of all of this is that we have to love our students. And even when you don't like them, you absolutely have to love them. Because if you love them, you'll want their souls to be saved. How do you show somebody you love them? By sacrificing. By sacrificing of your time. By sacrificing of your wallet. 
And th my students know that I love them. One of the ways, not only that I, do I tell them that I love them, and that I tell them, I'm honest with them. Sometimes I don't want to be here, but I'm here because I love you. And you don't want to be here, and I hope you come here because, you know, you're, you're you're trying to give as much as at least that I'm giving, that I'm going to take the time to prepare. So I hope that you come here and you respect the time that I put in for you. And it shows that I love them by, by sacrificing of my own wallet so that they can have a holy picture in their house. And being honest, because there might be times that you doubt and you have to give God the opportunity to come into your soul through other means, through sacramentals. And I personally have a lot of faith in Mary and sacramentals. So Mary is the best evangelist. St. Maximilian Colby said that Conversion is coming through grace. So we go to the mediatrix of all graces and she will work it out. My own conversion, there's a lot of different aspects to it, but I give most credit to my daily wearing of the brown scapular and wearing of the miraculous medal. Because although I might have had ups and downs, I look back and I see that Mary was with me through it all ever since those moments. That's where my soul was open to God's grace. I wish we had more time to talk about the scapular in this class. We don't. But I would encourage you to get them as best you can sell them on Marian sacramentals because Mary's role is to bring people closer to Jesus Christ. And we'll have to, there's not time for me to really go into much of that. Another thing that we need to do besides giving sacramentals and relying on sacramentals is instilling in them holy habits. So we are... Is, let, I was telling sister on the way up here, I could have had a vision of God himself, but that vision passes. Those, those moments, those moments of grace where we have like this real encounter with the Lord, those moments pass. And I've known people who've had mountaintop experiences and yet have fallen down to the pits of the valley because of one reason. They don't have holy habits. So they... And it's going to be hard because I have children and I am constantly instilling them in them holy habits and they do them, but I have to be doing them along with them. So it's going to be difficult. That's a difficult task. But what do I mean by holy habits? So devotions. The word devotion, think about what that word means, devoted. When I say I'm devoted to somebody, that means that I am committed. That means I'm going to go to that every single day or I'm going to offer that. I'm going to, I'm going to be faithful to that. So we, we need to encourage in them devotions. And there's a couple of reasons why. I have pamphlets enough, I think, I hope, for everybody to take one for themselves and then one for each of their students. This devotion that I'm going to recommend to you to in, encourage in all of your students from a very young age is the Three Hail Marys devotion. I'm encouraging this because it sounds simple. Just pray three Hail Marys. That's the least you can do. Three Hail Marys in the morning when you wake up. This devotion started with St. Mechtild in the 13th century. It's been promoted by many saints. It's promoted by many traditionally minded priests. By praying this devotion, you ask through Mary's powerful intercession for the grace to stay out of mortal sin this day and to have the grace of final perseverance at the hour of your death. And you're praying three Hail Marys, one in honor and thanksgiving to God the Father for the favors that he's done for Mary, one in honor and thanksgiving to God the Son for the favors that he's given to Mary, and one in honor and thanksgiving to the Holy Spirit for the favors he's done to Mary. Now, it might sound small, but imagine if they had this habit of only three Hail Marys. So many of the saints say that this is like the lifeline. This is like your life support. The very minimum that you would have to do to find a way that Mary would intercede for you in a way to save your soul. But imagine if they did this every single day. Many people have claimed that they have converted because they've had this bare minimum habit of the three Hail Marys. Because what does it do? So not only is this devotion, it's going to obtain for you the petition that you're asking, but on top of that, it's going to catechize. So we have a saying in the Catholic Church, Lex orandi, Lex credendi, Lex vivendi. What I pray impacts what I believe, and that impacts how I live. So by praying this prayer every day, it might not real, you might not realize it, but you're emphasizing the importance of Marian intercession. You're, you're catechizing them that there is a God the Father, a God the Son, a God the Holy Spirit. Every single day they're thinking about mortal sin. Whether they're committing it or not, they're still asking for the help not to do it. Every day they're thinking about the hour of their death. So that's pretty good. That's a good start. Because although they might just be saying it rote, at one point in their life it's going to be like... And God's grace is going to come through and Mary's intercession is going to work. Another thing that I have for you is a, a prayer card to your guardian angel and a prayer card to St. Michael. Again, I, I purposely used images where the, the saints are actually looking at you. 
So these are called icons, where the image is actually looking at you. The Greek Orthodox and the Eastern churches would call these windows into heaven. And the reason why I've chosen this is because images where the saint is actually looking at you, they have a sense of presence about them. It's not like I'm looking at an image of St. Michael stomping on the devil's head, which is good because theologically that reminds me that St. Michael will crush the serpent, but, or he won't crush the serpent, the Blessed Mother will crush the serpent, but he'll cast the serpent into hell. But by having them look at me, it offers them an opportunity to kind of speak to me. Similarly, if Our Lady was giving St. Dominic a rosary in this picture, it would remind me that Our Lady gave the rosary to St. Dominic. But in this picture, the Blessed Mother is looking directly at you, holding out a rosary to you. So whatever time you go to the Blessed Mother, you're like, Blessed Mother, I've got cancer. Blessed Mother, I was in a car accident. Blessed Mother, my son, he's on drugs. She's looking at you and saying, here's your, here's your answer. Here's your answer. Look at your problem. What, think of your problem. This is, this is what Mary would say to you. If you could have a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with the Blessed Virgin Mary, she'd be like, here's your answer. We'll talk more about the rosary in a moment. But that's what happened at Fatima. The children would go to her. People would say, hey, children of Fatima, go to the Blessed Mother and ask her to do this for me. I'm, got, I'm dying. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, my leg is going to fall off. They'd take the, the petition of the Blessed Mother, and the Blessed Mother every single time would say, this one will be healed next year, but they have to pray the rosary every day. This person is not going to get what they want. They will remain poor forever, but they must pray the rosary every... Even when you're not getting what you want, she still wants you to pray the rosary every day. So that's why I encourage devotions. I encourage sacramentals. And the last tip that I have for you before we start talking about the rosary is... But they all say when people used to, you know, people used to go on dances, they'd say, leave room for the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're not talking about dances here, but in your lesson plans, you need to leave room for the Holy Spirit. So we follow the guides that are given us because those have been thought out about what, at what stage they need to hear what things. But I encourage you to love, to sacrifice, and for every hour or every minute that those kids are in the class, you spend that much time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. You pray the rosary first, because Our Lady will crush the evil spirits, will help you to see better. We'll talk about that more when we talk about the rosary. And then sit there with the Lord, with your pen and paper, and say, Lord, with this lesson, what is it that you want to say? What is it that you want the kids to hear? What is it that is important to you? Because my words are good. My, I can, so there's two ways to approach things. I can say, Lord, this is the talk. This is the lesson I'm going to give. Will you please anoint this lesson and bless it? Or I can say, Lord, what is your message? Because his message is anointed. And then I will do the best I can to communicate that. And so that's how I came up with these three topics. Yesterday, I, I had already thought about some of these things before, but yesterday I went before the Blessed Sacrament and with a very heavy heart, I was like, Lord, what do I talk to these people about? And he's like, it's not about you, bro. It's about me. This is what I want. I want them to defend my children. I want them to sow, fades of se sow seeds of faith in them. And I want them to leave room for me to work. I am the one catechist. They're uniting their education, their teaching, their skills to my job when I was out preaching and teaching. They're not going to do it any better than me, but they can be my voice. They can be my instrument. So leave room for the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say, what is the Lord going to say? Was I at the chapel and did I hear voices saying, Gabriel, now write this down. Now, number one and number two, and these are your examples. No, that's not how it works. Maybe it works like that for you. If it does, thank God, because that's very easy. For me, it doesn't work that way. For me, I use my conscience. Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us, a well-formed conscience, when we're still and we listen to our conscience, again, that word listening, it's not necessarily accurate, but that's the best way we can describe it. When we listen to our conscience, the, a good person who seeks to do God's will can hear the voice of the Lord speaking. You're going to be judged based on your conscience, a well-formed conscience. So these are tuggings of the heart, pullings of your soul. And we do the best we can to give it a voice. For example, if you see somebody who's on a crutch and they're there with their groceries and they're trying to put their groceries in the trunk and you're not going to help them because it's awkward and you don't know them and they maybe don't speak English, but in your conscience you feel this tugging, I should really help that person. You feel it and you know it's a feeling, but you know in your mind what that would be saying if that was the voice of the Lord, right? So that's, that's what I mean when you go to the Blessed Sacrament and you listen. So it's not going to be a voice. It's going to be a more pulling of the heart. And it might not be that you even get anything. 
But you're there and you're offering the Lord and you're saying, Lord, I'll do the best I can with what you've given me. Giving me some conviction to, to emphasize. And those are going to be the seeds that the Lord wants planted. The seeds of the Lord are going to be far more, more fertile and fruitful than our personal seeds. Now, I want to talk to you about the rosary. Because I, the rosary, in my opinion, is the key to everything. It's the key that opens all the doors. It's the key that opens the door for us winning spiritual warfare. It's the key that makes us love the Blessed Sacrament more. It's the key that makes us love confession more. It's the key that gives us more willpower. Any problem that you have, the rosary is going to be the and Mary's intercession is going to be the means of obtaining the graces that you need. So again, the Blessed Mother is the mediatrix of all grace. So grace is a gift to us from God for your salvation. That's simple. Well, the greatest gift for salvation is Jesus Christ. Where did we get Jesus Christ? From the Blessed Virgin Mary. And God could have done it in any other way, but he chose to use Mary. And so because he's consistent, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's going to use the same means of bringing grace into our lives. And that's why people say, oh, the rosary, that's an old lady's prayer. I always see the old ladies praying it in church. The only people in church are still the ones who are, maybe they're old ladies, that's true, but they're only the ones who are there faithful to the Blessed Mother. There's a reason why only one apostle was faithful to the foot of the cross, because John was close to the Blessed Mother, so much so that Jesus gave him his own mother and gave us his own mother. So also at Fatima, and all the approved apparitions of the church, Lourdes, Fatima, uh, Cabejo, and uh, Akita, all these modern apparitions, our Lady has said a lot of things, but one thing that she's extremely consistent on is pray the rosary, 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 pray the rosary. And I personally would say, dang, Blessed Mother, isn't it important that I go to confession frequently? Isn't it important that I receive communion reverently? Isn't it important all these other things? But of course, she who's more wise and more prudent than I am and more you know, gifted with understanding and knowledge, she knows that by praying the rosary, all the other things come. It's true. All the other things come. Now, why is the rosary so powerful? So, it's got everything. It really does. It has vocal prayer. The vocal prayers to our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be. Not only is that vocal prayer powerful, but it's the Word of God. It's straight from the Bible. So the, the reason why Protestants like the Bible is because it speaks to them. And it does. It's the Word of God. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Similarly, I could take any passage of the Bible and use Lectio Divina because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, the Our Father and the Hail Mary in particular are extraordinarily scriptural in an even more powerful way because those are the words of the Lord himself. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hail Mary, full of grace. These are the words of the angel Gabriel, which, which he only spoke because he was told to by God. So this is important. The Hail Mary is extra powerful because it's at that moment, that yes of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that Satan's head was crushed. So it's scriptural, these vocal prayers. And so that will stir in, up the, stir in us the Holy Spirit. It's also meditative. We're thinking about the mysteries. So when you're meditating, and this is the most difficult part, obviously, in, at least in my experience, is actually thinking about the mystery. Do the best you can to say what it is. And even if you do a bad job, I'm so bad at praying the rosary so I don't pray it. No, pray it anyways. Do the best you can. I always say, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. And people say, what? That's a terrible attitude. No, it's not. Why? Let's say it's Mother's Day. If I was a good son and if I had all the means possible, I would take my mom out to dinner. I would buy her a Mother's Day card. I would get her a little cake and I'd say, Mom, I love you so much. But if I don't do that and I only, you know, call her, I better call her. I better do something. It's better to do something than to not do anything at all. Agreed, Mother? It, your child better at least send you a card, give you a hug, call you. If they're not going to do the best, it's better that they do at least something. Similarly, a bad rosary is better than no rosary at all. Trust me. The, the devil wants you to not say the rosary for any way means possible. And if he can say to you, you don't pray it well enough, so just, just why do you even try? Don't do that. Because even if you're just saying the words and your, your soul and your mind is as dry as sand, get the words out because they are sacred scripture. And what you will notice, at least for me, is the rosary is a lot like purgatory. 
for me. I know that sounds bad. But in the, after, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that that's actually a pretty good analogy. Because purgatory is what? It's difficult at first, but as it's going by, as it's getting closer, you see the Lord. Similarly, with, purg with the rosary, it might be difficult at first, but when you're done, you feel very good. You feel so much better, so much so to the point where you're even bragging. You're like, ah, I prayed the rosary today. Oh, you don't pray the rosary? Look at you. But we forget that sometimes it's very difficult for us to pray it. And it's also like, and say, well, it's not very nicely the rosary is like purgatory, but if you think about it, what helps get rid of our temporal punishment due to sin? Praying, prayers such as the rosary. So in a way, you can do your purgatory in purgatory, or you can pray the rosary here on earth and help get rid of some of your purgatory. So in a way, there's a little bit of an equivalence there. So on top of this, the scriptural aspect, but also it's Marian. Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So if you need Holy Spirit in your life, and we all do, pray the rosary. I pray the rosary whenever... I pray the rosary at least four times a day, at least, but I have reasons for that. I'm not, I won't necessarily get into them. But whenever I'm, I, and I suffer from depression and I suffer from anxiety, and they're not like all the time, but they're just random stabs of darkness. And usually they begin if I'm behind on my rosaries. But the moment that I finish my fourth rosary, it's like a wall goes up, a spiritual wall of grace that blocks out all spiritual attacks, and it's like impenetrable. I could, I could walk through fire with, with the confidence that I have in God after I've prayed the rosary. And part of that is, it's multifaceted, that the, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. The Blessed Mother's intercession is most powerful. She's not, she, it's her role to crush the head of the serpent in our lives. And so we should not be ashamed and we should not be afraid of being too Marian. Also, this increases my willpower. What do you mean willpower? We live in an age where we can barely do anything that's not instantaneous. I was complaining about having to fly to another place. I was telling one of the sisters, like I was complaining about having to fly and then, because it's such a long distance, and then I thought, man, the, the things that the saints endured are far, far greater than what I have to endure. All I am here doing, I get food. On an airplane, they bring me food. They bring, bring me drinks. There's air conditioning. And here I am complaining. But that's because of the culture that I live in that has taught me to be effeminate, that has taught me to be weak, to lack willpower. But by praying the rosary every single day, your willpower goes up. Your inner strength goes up. Why? Because it's not fun. It's not fun. I tell my students that all the time. It's not fun. Nobody says... I would rather pray the rosary than go play. I would rather pray the rosary than watch TV and live the easy life. No, but you know what? Do it anyways because it's good for you and you will notice the difference. If you're not praying the rosary every single day, I challenge you, start praying the rosary every day of your life and you will notice a change. And what will happen is you won't be able to live without it. If, if those who do pray the rosary every day, you know you wouldn't be able to go to sleep at night unless you did it because you need the strength, you need the grace. Now, a couple of tips on praying the rosary, the very basic. Remember when you're actually praying your prayers that you're talking to somebody. So it can be very easy and we can be like, Hell Mary, full of grace, Lord, is with the blessed of the Most Holy Blessed is the Holy Mary, Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now and ever. And again, that's better than nothing. But in your mind, use your imagination. Your words are going straight to the ears of the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is present with you. You might not feel it. You might not see it. At Lourdes, when St. Bernadette was praying the rosary with the Blessed Virgin Mary, there were thousands of other people there praying right alongside her. Did they see her? Did they see the Blessed Mother? Did they feel her? No, they didn't, but she was there. Similarly, when we're praying the rosary, the Blessed Mother is there and you have nothing to fear. When doubt, when fear, anxiety crop up in your life, start to pray the rosary. Fear and doubt and anxiety are all from the devil. We might suffer from them naturally, but supernaturally we can do something to help ourselves out. Now, I'm going to talk about the 15 promises of the rosary because Our Lady is very, very smart. The more difficult the devotion is, the more she's going to bribe us. Bribe, that's such an ugly word. Okay, the more she's going to reward us. Think about it. Nobody does anything unless they think they're going to get something out of it. I pray the rosary. I love the Blessed Virgin Mary. But if I didn't feel like I had to because I needed some sense of consolation, some sense of hope, nobody would do it. Why do your children clean their room? Because they're good? No. Why do they do their homework? Because they're good? Not really. 
because they, they think that doing their homework will make them happier than if they didn't. So this is very human, and that's okay. God takes our selfish desires, our selfish intentions. He says, that's good enough. And it's like the Blessed Mother is a fisherman. She says, oh, you want the bait? You need help? Here. And you catch the hook in your mouth, the cross. And then she's like pulling you bead by bead. I'm going to pull you out of your selfish desires. I'm going to pull you out of your self-will and your self-love. So she's given at least, there's many more promises, but at least 15 promises. Let's go through some of them quickly because we all need inspiration and encouragement. Number one, whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. Some people interpret this word as being great graces, but I say, no, let's use the word signal because the next promise is great graces. So why would the first promise be great graces and the second promise be great graces? That would be a little bit repetitive. So let's just pretend like she means signal graces, signs. How often in our life do we say, God, if I only knew what to do, please. Well, Mary, according to St. Dominic and St. Alan de la Roche, or Roche, or however you pronounce his last name, you pray the rosary and you'll get gifts of discernment, no, a greater ease at knowing God's will, signals, signs. So for example, um, on the flight up here, the, the lady who was checking me in, she had an image of Our Lady Guadalupe on her neck on her necklace. And I immediately noticed this as a sign because I'm wearing a Mary medal. She's wearing a Mary medal. She welcomed me and she says, look, you have an opportunity to get a new seat. And I said, oh, really, blessed mother. <laughs> and then she said, because again, I remember I said, I, I don't like to fly. I have anxiety. I get claustrophobic. And she said, look, I have a special seat right here, B7. And I said, oh, seven's a good number. Let's take a look. And what was it? The, the, the way the aisle was, was an L-shaped. So I was right here with an aisle in front of me and an aisle to the side of me. I had the best seat in the whole plane. But had I gone to some other teller, they might not have told me that. But because she had the Blessed Mother, she saw my Blessed Mother, I took that as a signal grace, as a sign that I should go with this woman and I should trust her. That's a small example. But to most people, they would say, that's just a coincidence, boy. Yeah, okay, coincidence for you, but I felt it in my soul. I felt this confidence, a signal grace. Number two. I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to those who shall recite the rosary. I think of St. John Paul II. He was shot at point-blank rage twice by a gunman, Mehmet Aliaja, on the feast, on the memorial of Our Lady of Fatima. And everybody thought he was dead, but and because he was shot right through the vital organs. But somehow the shards of the bullet just somehow were miraculously around. The bullet just somehow missed all of them. And the, the gunman was like, that's impossible. He must be dead. And Pope John Paul II, very calmly, they said, oh, Holy Father, you're dying. He says, don't worry. I'm not going to die. How do you know? Because although one hand fired the gun, another finger was directing the bullet. Number three, the rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice. It will decrease sin. And it will defeat heresies. It, this is rooted in sacred scripture. All heresies can be established, can be crushed by going back to the faith, by following sacred scripture. Sacred scripture is the fountain of orthodoxy, if, 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 especially if we're reading it in line of the Catholic Church. Sin and hell don't stand a chance against the Blessed Virgin Mary. There are stories in the book of the secret of the rosary that say that, that so many souls have been snatched from the hands of Satan because at the last moment they've gone to the Blessed Virgin Mary and her powerful intercession. Because remember this, this is another good reason. You pray this Hail Mary every day. Let's say you prayed it every day for 56 years, yes. And this is 50 Hail Marys. You're praying, pray for me now and at the hour of my death. At the hour of your death, you're going to get a collection of every single Hail Mary that you have ever said. So if you've prayed 56 years worth of rosaries, you say, I pray, I don't get any grace, I'm still scared to die. At the hour of your death, imagine if you prayed one million Hail Marys. That's how many Hail Marys you get if you've prayed every day for 56 years. You get one million Hail Marys. You say, I'm already too old. I have not started. I'm only going to get one, 10,000. Okay, I'll give you a deal. Pray four rosaries a day for 14 years. You only got 14 years of life? 14 years, still one million Hail Marys. The reason why I bring up the four rosaries a day is because originally when the Blessed Mother revealed this to St. Dominic and it was promoted by St. Louis de Montfort, if you read the book, The Secret of the Rosary, he says that five decades is for children. 
He says, little children, I know you could not pray the entire, the entire rosary all 15, all 15 decades. At least pray five decades every day. And then if you read the part about sinners, where he's talking to sinners, he says, do the best you can to pray all 15 mysteries. So that's why I say we do all of them. I, at least I do. And, and if you think about it, so many saints did three rosaries a day. Saint Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the church. Saint Francis Xavier, doctor of the church. Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Saint Francis Borgia. Saint uh, John the Twenty-Third. They all did this. So if you're only doing one right now, I challenge you to do one or two more, and you'll already be tied. Because in my opinion. Marian devotion is a signal to your true degree of holiness. You'll be tied in holiness to John the 23rd, to doctors of the church. And even better, but you'll be saying, Gabriel, but John Paul II added one more mystery. I know. So even one more, and you'll be doing more rosaries than all of these heavyweight saints of the church. You'll be on the equal holy status as John Paul II and Mother Teresa. Don't you want your kids to have a Mother Teresa teaching them? Come on. So four rosaries is nothing. It goes by quickly. And then 14 years, well, imagine 56 years of four rosaries a day. Oh my gosh. At the hour of your death, you're going to be like, I see Mary. And everybody in the room is going to be shocked. And then you're going to be dying with a rosary in your hand. It's going to be beautiful. All right. I'm gonna, I, we don't have time to go through all of these. You can read. Let's close with the quote at the very, very bottom. Sister Lucia, sister of Fatima, she saw the Virgin Mary herself. How many of you have had many visits to the Virgin Mary? I haven't. If you have, you can, be, you can keep your humility and keep your hand down. But she had many visions. The greatest modern apparition in the history of the Catholic Church, this woman was blessed to experience them and to hand on devotion to the Immaculate Heart. This is her message, for me at least. This is her closing message. Let's read it together. The most holy virgin in these last times in which we live has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the rosary to such an extent that there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is. Will you hear that? Let's pause. There is no problem. No problem, no matter how difficult it is. Whether temporal, I don't have any money. Guess what? The first miracle that Jesus did was a temporal problem. They had no wine and he wasn't going to help them. But Mary said, I know that this is going to lead you on the way of the cross, doing your first sign. But guess what? I'm asking you to do it. Give them some wine, please. I'll make it, it'll be symbolic. It'll be symbolic. Come on, just give them the wine. All right. So even temporal problems, or above all, of course, spiritual, in the personal life of each one of us, are families that cannot be solved by the rosary. There is no problem, I tell you. So you say, but what about, there is no problem. Because you'd be thinking of all the problems that you have. No matter how difficult it is that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. I can attest to this in my own life. I was the worst sinner, the worst everything, and now I speak so freely, my soul is so free, and I give all credit to blessed sacrament and praying of the Holy Rosary. We all have the same Holy Spirit that was given at Pentecost. We just have to be faithful to the Blessed Mother, and allow room for the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. We'll pray three more Hail Marys for all of our students. And then afterwards, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and you obviously enjoyed this content or you still wouldn't be watching, subscribe to this channel. Also, I have two other YouTube channels and you're gonna find videos there that I consider amazing. Some of them that are the best in the field on the topic. God bless you, God love you. Check out my other videos. Subscribe and I hope to see you soon.